Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Naveen Flooring International Limited Q1 FY24 earnings conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode. And there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Bhavya Shah from Orient Capital. Thank you. And over to you, Mr. Shah. Uh, thank you and welcome to the Q1 FI24 earnings conference call. Today on this call, we have Mr. Radesh Welling, Managing Director, and Mr. Anish Ganatra, Chief Financial Officer of Navin Flooring International Limited. This conference call may contain forward-looking statements about the company, which are based on beliefs, opinions, and expectations as of today. Actual results may differ materially. These statements are not the guarantees of future performance and involve risks and uncertainties that are difficult to predict. Our detailed safe harbor statement is given on page number 2 of investor presentation of company, which has been uploaded on the stock exchange and company's website as well. With this, now I hand over the call to Mr. Radesh Welling for his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Good morning and a warm welcome to all the participants. On this call today, I am joined by Mr. Anish Ganatra, our Chief Financial Officer and our Investor Relations Partner, Orient Capital. I hope all of you got an opportunity to go through our financial results and investor presentation which have been uploaded on the stock exchange as well as on the company's website. Let me now start with key highlights for the first quarter of FY24 followed by business segment-wise updates and then we'll take you through financial highlights for the period under review. I'm pleased to report our quarterly revenue of rupees 491 crore marking a growth of 24% on year-on-year -year basis. All our businesses continue to perform well. Despite some product-specific demand headwinds, overall our resilient business model performed well in this quarter, but more importantly is positioned well for future profitable growth. We saw strong YY revenue growth in specialty and CDMO business units, whereas revenue growth in HPP business unit fell short of our initial expectations primarily due to shutdowns in AHF and HFO clients. These being one of events, we expect business to run on normalized basis from Q2 onwards. Demand for, Q, uh, demand for R22 in Q1 was muted. Weak summer impacted refrigerant gas sales in domestic as well as export markets. Our operating EBITDA registered growth of 15% wire at rupees 114 crores. EBITDA margin stood at 23.3%. We are optimistic about higher capacity utilization in the coming quarters and this will positively impact our operating margins. Higher depreciation and interest expenses were charged due to capitalization of the new capacities in NFSL and the associated financing. We have shown remarkable progress even during unpredictable periods, capitalizing on opportunities for expansion executing numerous projects parallelly but in a very disciplined manner and expediting our overall profitable progress. I am pleased to inform you all that the board of directors held at a meeting yesterday approved capex of rupees 30 crore towards development of a completely new capability in Surat. We are happy to inform you all signing of a material supplies agreement with Fermion for a set of patented commercial stage molecules in our CDA mode division. This initial agreement spans over three years, commencing from calendar year 2025, and is expected to create new growth opportunities for us. I now like to quickly brief you on the status of various ongoing capexes. Our AHF project for adding 40,000 metric tons of hydrofluoric acid capacity at the age is progressing as per schedule. We have signed basic engineering technology and equipment agreement with global leader in this space. As a reminder, this capacity allows us to address the rising demand in the pharmaceutical and agrochemical sectors 
as well as in the emerging areas like EV, battery chemicals, solar, etc. Our agro specialty capex is progressing well so far and is scheduled for commissioning end of this calendar year. Our 32 plant stabilization is in progress and sales expected to start in Q2 FY24. I would now like to discuss the operating performance of each of the business units. Our specialty chemicals business continued to perform extremely well. In Q1 FY24, we reported highest ever quarterly sales with revenue growth of 31% on a year-on-year basis, amounting to Rs. 230 crore. Strong order flow continues to strengthen long-term growth visibility in this division. Our HPP business demonstrated steady growth in Q1 FY24 with revenue reaching 169 crore, representing an 11% increase compared to the corresponding period last year. This growth was primarily driven by expanded capacities in NFSL. However, it is important to note that the overall growth was somewhat restrained due to shutdown at our plants. The plants are now back to normalcy and running at optimal capacities. Our CDMO business reported strong year-on-year -year revenue growth in Q1 FY24 with the revenue of Rs. 93 crore reflecting YOI growth of 33% as compared to the same period last year. Also, we are pleased to share that we have identified several promising late-stage opportunities and development work is currently in progress, positioning us for continued growth in the segment. Detailed engineering work for CGMP4 is progressing well and will be taken to the board for approval in the coming quarters. I'll now hand over the line to Mr. Anish Ganatra to give you a brief on the financial performance of the company. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, good morning to all the participants. I will share the highlights of our performance for quarter 1 FY24, post which we will be happy to take questions from all of you. The company reported growth of 24% in net revenue from operations to Rs. 491 crores against Rs. 398 crores in Q1 FY23. Operating EBITDA grew by about 15% year-on-year to 114 crores as against 99 crores in Q1 FY23. EBITDA margin stood at 23.3% for Q1 FY24. Operating PBT stood at 73 crores and PAT stood at 62 crores, lower by 15% and 17% year-on-year respectively, primarily due to depreciation for the aid assets and interest charge associated with the financing thereof. So that's all from my side. We will now open the floor for Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to withdraw yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have the first question from the line of Sudarshan Padmanabhan from GM Financial PMS. Please go ahead. Yeah. So, I, what I would like to understand is on the plant shutdown that we had taken because, you know, uh, this is relatively a new plant. So, I mean, what has basically triggered the shutdown operationally? And second is with respect to the volumes that we are supposed to send, you know, supply to Honeywell. Is the volume for the full year on track? I mean, whether, you know, we can basically... Uh, uh, capitalize, you know, on higher volumes in the second, third, and fourth quarter to make up for the first quarter. Yeah, hi, good morning. So, uh, if uh, as, I, as we had mentioned before, in this particular quarter, we had planned a uh, planned shutdown for our uh, HFO plant, which, which was basically in the month of April. And hence, we uh, also had planned uh, plan shut down for our AHF plant in Surat so that it coincides with, uh, you know, the HFO plan shut down. Accordingly, the plan basically started by end of April, beginning of May, and we were ramping up capacity, but we had some issues uh, in the plant in June. Uh, as we have mentioned before, there are two sets of manufacturing plants there, and there are obviously a lot of ancillary plants. So in one of the plants, 
we had this we had some issue in the down the downstream section the purification section not in the main the reaction section because of which we had to take a shutdown and we had to actually do uh, some changes in the equipment etc some of the columns etc had to be changed because of which the shutdown uh, actually went on for a little longer than uh, what we had uh, expected initially so that was the reason and we uh, in the process we lost Uh, almost close to four months, uh, four weeks of production. To your question, in terms of demand, uh, as you know, given what's going on in the market, the demand for the year has changed uh, quite a few times. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the actual volume request that we have received from Honeywell has changed a few times. But whatever volume we have missed out in Q1. we expect that in q2 and q3 we should be able to make up that volume just to give you some idea uh, the plant has now started and will be running to uh, optimal capacity and we expect that the plant will do so for the uh, following quarters uh, following months in this quarter and whatever we produce in the month of whatever was produced in the month of july and whatever will be produced in the month of august all of that we will be required to supply immediately just to you know take care of that uh, backlog that we saw in q1 so overall to your question we don't think that this particular gap that we saw in production in q1 because of this unplanned shutdown will have any significant negative impact on the overall volume taken by Honeywell in the year sure adesh and uh, with respect to you know the volumes that was renegotiated any idea what would be the quantum of change i mean if downwards no no there is no volume negotiated per se there is a volume forecast which they typically send to us for the following 6 months and we have actually constantly seen that change and this is not something which is only relevant to this product and honeywell this is actually across the board we are actually seeing lot of demand volatility so there are times when it that the numbers have gone down there are times in fact you know in the month of june the sell of the final product was extremely strong and the numbers then got further revised little upward so that there is a constant revision that is going on given the overall uh demand uncertainty that our customers are also seeing in the market sure and one final question before i join back the queue is on the refrigerant gas we are seeing uh, you know again very low demand as you mentioned in the press release as well uh, due to the summer and even the prices have you know kind of trended down do we see things improving say you know probably from the second quarter or whatever that we are seeing both in the volumes and prices probably you know would impact Yes, as for the full year versus what we had initially thought. So uh, it's it's a little difficult for us to comment on that because, as you know, R22, the business tends to be little seasonal. Q4 and Q1, that is, you know, typically February, March, April, May, uh, tend to be the high seasons because of summer, etc. now if you actually miss out on that summer season it's a little difficult to make up, make up that quantum in the month of q2 also in the month in q2 or q3 but typically what happens is you know these refrigerators this air conditions which are there in the market require servicing uh, they require and hence they require gas we expect some of that loss in volume to actually come back from end q3 onwards but we don't see that uh, gap uh, uh, you know being bridged in in the in the quarter in the q2 quarter but we expect that toward end of q3 we will actually see demand uptick uh, and and the overall volume that we will sell in q3 and q4 we expect it to be higher than what we sold uh, last year in the in the same quarters and this is specifically related to r22 going into msc uh, applications Sure. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I'll turn back to Kehra. More question. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Abhijit Akela from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for taking my questions. 
um on the uh, on, on the cdmo business if you could uh, you know please offer us an, an outlook for this year and next year um uh, I believe the Fermion contract uh, kicks in only from CY 25. So should we expect that to start meaningful contributions only from 26? And if so, how significant could it be potentially? But in the meantime, for 24 and 25, uh, you know, do we believe we are well placed for say 20 percent plus growth for the CDM of business in the meantime? Yeah. So the uh, agreement that we have signed with uh, Fermion are. for multiple late stage molecules one of them is already commercial and the first commercial supply and i'm talking at uh, uh, when i talk about commercial supply i mean you know a uh, uh, major quantity will be supplied from beginning of calendar year 25 but the supply has already started so we have already supplied qualification batches for the first molecule the product has been approved and now they have actually placed order for a slightly larger quantity which we are required to supply by end of q3 uh, and also now we have actually received request from them to forward uh, samples for qualification for the other two molecules which are there as a part of the agreement so in this year calendar year 23 and calendar year 24 we will be supplying some molecule uh, some quantity but those will be limited uh, volume primarily meant for qualification etc and the actual commercial supply will start from fy26 and some of that will actually go from our cgmp4 uh, as that gets uh, ready the overall outlook for cdmo pretty much remains the same as uh, we have provided in the past quarter we have actually seen pretty strong uh, order flow in the following quarters we are actually not seeing significant sales from a larger repeat business so for example you know towards end of 23 or uh, towards end of calendar year 22 beginning of 23 we had actually supplied a larger volumes for uh, uh you know to uh, three of our customers so the next uh batch will be required by them from beginning of 24 onwards having said that currently we are actually doing a lot of first time molecules now these are either phase 1 or a lot of these are actually late stage molecules so we expect that the scale up which typically takes about 5 to 6 years as the molecule goes from phase 1 to phase 3 to commercial typically takes a you know longer uh, uh, period in this case it will basically take significantly shorter period because though these are first time customers and first time supplies these are for late stage molecules and hence the scale up will happen much quicker now so we are actually seeing lot of good traction on late stage opportunities that we had decided to focus on as a part of our strategy from last year onwards so there that is where we are seeing pretty good traction now understood uh, that's helpful thank you and uh, just the other question i had was uh, with regard to the specialty chemicals business uh, uh, in particular uh, you know the multi purpose plant uh, has it sort of ramped up to the uh, kind of revenue potential that you might have had in mind uh, you know at the outset Uh, also are the other projects within specialty chemicals now running at full and is there any sign of demand softness from say the agrochemical sector or any other given the kind of market and wanna say going through thank you so much so on specialty uh, as you know in the hage we have two new plants there is one dedicated plant for agrochemicals and then there is a multi purpose plant the agrochemical plant is actually which is a dedicated agrochemical plant is running to full capacity the mpp is not yet running to full capacity uh, you know it it's uh, we expect that uh, as we had indicated before we uh, expect that uh, it will basically sh- uh, start getting to full capacity from year 2 onwards so which is from next year onwards overall uh, on the uh, demand side uh you know there are a few molecules where we are seeing issue primarily there is one 
large molecule as i had indicated in the month of may when we uh, met to discuss q4 performance i had actually talked about one large molecule which was being supplied from surat uh, where uh, the demand had actually come down almost to zero in uh, calendar year q1 and q2 that is where we are actually seeing that that is where we were seeing significant uh, uh, headwind because we actually supplied uh, almost zero volume in q1 and q2 of calendar year 23 which is why you are actually when you look at the standalone navin fluorine numbers you see a gap because that molecule was been supplied from surat now there the good news is that we have actually received a forecast for a second half of calendar year 23 and the supply has restarted and uh, uh, you know the the plant will again now start running to full capacity uh, from q3 onwards so that that is what is expected given the demand forecast that we have received from the customer so there was one particular molecule where there was a significant downturn but there from h2 onwards we expect uh, the volume to again come back this is as per the forecast that we have received from the customers as of today these numbers are changing almost on a monthly basis they go down they go up we were actually not expecting this uptick to happen so quickly we were actually expecting it to start from only end of q4 calendar year 23 but we have actually received that almost two quarters uh, ahead so as i said before also uh, the numbers are changing uh, almost month on month basis sometimes they are going down sometimes they are actually going up in some of our main products we have actually seen uh, 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 you know the forecast has actually been taken up by some of our customers got it thank you so much and uh, wish you all the best thank you thank you ladies and gentlemen in order to ensure that the management will be able to address questions from all participants in the conference please limit your questions to two per participant should you have a follow up question please rejoin the queue thank you the next question is from the line of Vivek Rajamani from Morgan Stanley please go ahead um hi sir thank you so much for the presentation uh so first question was on the specialty chemical side uh just for this quarter would be possible to give some color whether it was more of a volume story or did you also see some margin expansion and just for you know going for for f24 uh do you still think it's going to be more of a volume story given that some of your capacities are ramping up or do you also expect to see some of the margin tailwinds start coming through from uh, next couple of quarters that was the first question uh you are going to ask second question or should do you want me to answer the first question before you go to the second uh okay i'll just ask the second question itself uh Uh, so you've uh, you know given a lot of detail in terms of the outlook uh, that you've mentioned. Obviously, it's uh, it's very dynamic. I uh, just wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, we've obviously been hearing that you know we've seen some corrections in the raw material prices, and you know there's obviously some risks that other players have been flagging that you know margins could compress as some of these prices come down. Uh, you obviously uh, you know gave a lot of sense on the demand side. If you could just speak on the margin trends as well, that would be really helpful. Thank you so much. Sure. So uh, I think uh, on your first question on speciality, the growth that we are uh, seeing primarily coming from the new product introductions and the volume. Uh, it's not so much from pricing or uh, or the margins. It's primarily volume, and that is what we will continue to see uh, in the coming quarters also. now if you look at lot of these new molecules that we have either introduced or are working on lot of them have higher margins than uh, the molecules that we have had in our legacy portfolio so directionally the margins will keep expanding as we move forward having said that the margins of the products that we have in our portfolio uh, some of them actually vary from product to product significantly and hence a uh, margin also gets impacted by product mix so for example uh, i earlier talked about this particular product that we were selling from surat where h1 of calendar year 23 we did not sell anything that product is is a very high margin product 
So if you actually don't have any volume of that product, it you know clearly impacts the margin. Now that you know the supply will now start of that particular product, it will basically positively have uh, it will positively impact the margin of the specialty business as well as the overall business. Uh, on the uh, overall at the overall company level, I think it's a very similar story. Uh, you know, uh, our contribution margins. Uh, in different businesses are are very different. So you know, I, I think I've mentioned this before as well. I'm, I'm talking about the contribution margin or a gross margin. Of course, EBITDA margins are very very similar because some of these higher contribution margin businesses also have a higher fixed cost load. Uh, but overall, the margins are uh, contribution mar the operating margins are very similar. But then quarter to quarter, our overall margins change depending on which business is actually selling more and which business is selling less. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know if that helps you. No, sir. Very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sanjesh Jain from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Uh, thanks, Avesh, for taking my question. I got two questions. Uh, first, on the uh, uh, the Honeywell contract, uh, last year we got a 15 to 20 percent price tag because of a significant uh, inflation in the raw material. Uh, this year we are probably in the exactly opposite side of it, where the prices have fallen very sharply. Uh, when is this uh, reset of prices going to happen? That's number one. And number two, an attached question to that is that is that a right understanding we had earlier that our margins in Honeywell contract is as a percentage of revenue? Uh, that's the first question. Uh, second question is for the Anish uh, on the operating cost. This quarter, we the other expenses have dropped by 43 crores uh, quarter on quarter. Uh, what has led to such a sharp drop? I thought it's largely a fixed cost. Uh, Probably some freight cost and power cost would be saving because of plant shutdown, but uh, the drop looks uh, uh, quite steep there. And a related question on depreciation, what is the impact of changes that we did last year on this quarter? Can you quantify that number? That is from my side. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so uh, on the Honeywell contract, uh, we have a true up mechanism. And as per the earlier agreement, we were required to do that true up or true down once a year. But given the volatility in the market right now, we, what we are trying to do is that we try to do a true up or a true down on a quarterly basis. So end of quarter, we actually estimate what the cost is likely to be for the following quarter. We accordingly change the pricing. And then whatever has actually happened, whatever that delta is, which typically is not uh, significant, we adjust in the following quarter's pricing. So whatever you are currently seeing, whatever is uh, you know, getting reflected in the revenue is actually the true up pricing, true up or true down pricing. So uh, that is one. Second is, uh, in terms of margin, uh, I think, you know, it will be difficult for me to comment because there's a lot of confidentiality, this one, attached to it. So it will be difficult for me to comment on how that uh, uh, margin piece works as far as the Honeywell contract is concerned. Sanjesh, thanks for your questions. Um, on the uh, other expenses, you're absolutely right. There is a quarter-on-quarter -quarter drop from 138 crores to 95 crores. Now, if you look at that, we can sort of analyze it into two buckets. The 138 crores had certain one-offs. You know, these were related to, uh, you know, consultancy charges. I think as we had spoken to you even in the last quarter, uh, there's also some exceptionally high repair cost that was into it, and there were some provisions. Now, all of that put together is about 15 crores. So one-offs included in the 138 crore are about 15 crores. The balance 28 crores is related to activity. If you look, if you look at the quarter on quarter activity, our CDMO numbers for last quarter were about 180 crores. This quarter we are talking 70 crores. So there is an activity drop from CDMO that leads to some uh, reduction in the um, uh, reduction of that cost, and also the shutdowns, as you rightly mentioned, in Orchid. So that's on the other expenses. On the depreciation, as we said last time, our guidance continues similarly, which is about 22 crores, 20 to 22 crores. 
of depreciation charge per quarter. This relates to, uh, you know, if you look at the split of the depreciation, that is about uh, 11 and a half crore in NFIL and about uh, 9, 10 crores in uh, NFASL. Uh, thanks, Anish. Just one thing on the depreciation. What is the impact of the change of the life on this 22 crore? So last time when we, last quarter, we did the uh, estimate uh, change. And uh, last quarter, we had quantified the number as 20 crore for the quarter. Now, of course, the way that gets calculated in the in the financials is you look at the full year depreciation for the new method and the old method. So there is a double dip in the Q4. But, you know, if you had to get a number, that would be about 15 crores. You know, so last quarter, what you saw was about 22 crores should have been the hit in the last, in FI23, I'm talking, yeah? Yeah, fair enough. Thanks, Radesh. Thanks, Anish, for all the answers and the best of tips for the coming quarters. Thank you, Radesh. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ankur Periwal from Access Capital. Please go ahead. So, uh, the first question on the CDMO side, uh, on the Fermian contract, is this the same that, uh, you know, we had discussed upon earlier, the $16 million opportunity, or is it uh, an incremental to that? No, no, uh, this is a new one. That was with a different customer. Sure. So, so uh, if I if I got it right, so uh, this uh, Fermian contract is incremental, which will drive growth for us. The $16 million is one which is... Uh, it, which has already come into the numbers or it is another opportunity that will come? No, no. So, uh, $16 million was not an agreement. It was a PO that we had actually received. Uh, that has been supplied uh, in the last financial year. Uh, but that molecule is actually doing extremely well. That is with another large biopharma company. And as I had indicated before, we are actually expecting a further scale-up uh, of that uh, in the calendar year 24. So you will actually see a repeat of that happening uh, in the year, calendar year 24, and the volume actually will be even higher. We expect the, the quantum of the PO at that point in time to be even higher. Uh, we're just trying to understand uh, how much would that be because that is also going to be uh, the basis of for our uh, CGMP4. This particular contract is uh, is a completely different contract with a completely different customer for different molecules. Sure, Adesh. And, and another follow-up there, uh, since you mentioned most of this growth is led by uh, the new late-stage molecules that we are reporting now, while the older ones are yet to pitch in, uh, should, should one factor in that this number can grow at a much faster pace going at it once the older ones also start contributing with maybe macro-stabilizing? Yeah, so uh, the, the distinction between old and new, when I say old, these are the molecules. See, traditionally the business, our business was, uh, uh, you know, engaging with uh, the customers right from clinical stage or phase one stage and continue to work on those molecules as they scale up. Now, as those molecules scale up, get to phase three or commercial stage, the volume increases. But typically what we have seen is that there is an order that is placed by the customer. We supply that quantity to them, then they convert it into the API formulation, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of times this entire piece happens on a campaign basis. And the campaign typically is run by the customers once in every two years. And that is why we see a significant chunk coming this year, then the following year nothing, and then again the following year. So now if you if, if you basically run a business where a lot of these you know, uh, engagements all typically start at phase one, then the business tends to be extremely lumpy. And hence what we had decided last year was to consciously focus on a lot more late stage opportunities and position yourself to an alt as, as an alternate uh, supplier for those late stage opportunities and which is what now we have actually started doing. So these are late stage opportunities, but new to us. So we are just supplying them the qualification batches, etc. So to your question, the, uh, the answer is absolutely because as these qualification batches get approved and the demand continues to be there for those molecules, the scale up will be much faster than what we have seen traditionally because the entry point itself is either late stage phase two or phase three. Great. That, that's very clear. Thanks for the detailed answer, Rakesh. Thank you and all the best.
Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Archit Joshi from BNK Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, uh, I have a few. Uh, the first one, you did mention about some sort of demand volatility that, that you're experiencing in some of the businesses. Uh, uh, and now that we are hearing a lot of talk on inventory restocking, especially on the agri side, and the fact that uh, two of our plants in the hedge are dedicated uh, towards the agrochemical sector, uh, are you seeing some sort of uh, weakness there? Uh, and number two, uh, so in the HFO plant, I think we, we had signed a contract for seven years and the 400 crore annual number that one would have anticipated earlier, there were some cost escalations and uh, the revenue number uh, seemed to be a little higher because of the cost. Uh, would there be any change to that number? <coughs> uh, sorry, what was the number you talked about? For the second question, uh, I wasn't sorry. able to get part of your question. Yeah, so sir, it was a 2800 crore contract for seven years. So uh, approximately 400 crores a year. That's how I calculated. But I think during the plant visit, you mentioned that uh, because of some different uh, forex and some costs going up, that was uh, a little upwards of 400 crores. Uh, what would be the outlook for this year on, on to that account? Yeah. So uh, I think to your first question, uh, I think I have already mentioned that uh, we have two plants. Uh, there is a dedicated agro uh, plant in the heat, which is running to full capacity. Uh, that has been running uh, in Q4, it ran full capacity. Q1, it ran to full capacity. We expect that Q2 also, it will run to full capacity. It's a little difficult for me to give you uh, this one for Q3 and Q4, but right now it is running to full capacity. MPP, we expect that the capacity utilization will be uh, lower this year, but that is how it was planned. And we expect the capacity utilization to, uh, uh, you know, get to optimal level from the next uh, year. Uh, uh, so basically, I'm talking about calendar year 24 onwards. Uh, of the four molecules that we have planned in MPP, uh, we are seeing some issues on uh, the two molecules, but that is not really resulting into any uh, downturn in terms of sales for us uh, this year. Uh, next year, when we have actually earlier expected for the volume ramp up to happen, we believe that this destocking process would have actually got uh, over, got done, and we expect that the demand uh, to be back uh, as per our earlier expectation. The good news is that for all the molecules, this four plus one molecule that we uh, mapped in these new assets in the H, the end market demand continues to be very strong. So whatever volatility that we are seeing is primarily from the perspective of destocking. And hence, a one point of view that we are looking at is that next year, if the demand continues to be as strong, the end consumer demand continues to be as strong as it is today, or as it is uh, as strong as it is this year, and some of uh, that destocking starts reversing into restocking, what would that really mean for the demand uh, from uh, for our intermediates? Because we expect that the, mm -hmm. there will be a significant uptick in demand next year, at least basis on the some of the initial conversations that we've had with our customer. Uh, on the second point, uh, it will be difficult for me to give you an outlook for this particular year uh, for uh, the HFO, but overall uh, your uh, understanding is absolutely right. So that has happened because of uh, two main reasons. I mean, obviously the cost, you know, keeps having impact on quarter to quarter basis. It's, it's different, but primarily because of two reasons. One, uh, as you know, it's a dollar denominated contract and as the dollar appreciates, it has impact on the rupee revenue that we generate from the contract. Uh, and the second, there was uh, some cost escalation, which was within the prescribed limit of 10%, and there was a pass-through mechanism, uh, which uh, was defined in the agreement. So because of that, there is an uh, increase in the pricing, uh, and, and hence increase in the realization. Uh, sure, sir. Uh, I have uh, two more I'll just squeeze in uh, quickly. 
Uh, so one on the working capital in FY23, we saw uh, some jump in our receivable and inventory days and that, you know, supplementarily that we are adding new customers. Uh, would that would you allude that to uh, the fact that newer customers are having slightly higher uh, days in terms of credit, uh, and how, what would be the sustainable level of working capital days that we see going ahead? And sir, if you can also comment on uh, the recent uh, resolution by one of our uh, CXOs in CDMO, uh, what was his contribution like, and uh, how how uh, are we looking at this with respect to replacement of uh, in the in the in the current existing hierarchy. Thank you. So let me take the second question first, and then I will let Anish uh, respond to your question on working capital. So uh, this was uh, you are referring to resignation of Ravi, who uh, was the CEO of our CDMO business. As you know, he uh, joined the company last year. He actually decided that he wanted to do something of his own. Uh, and hence he uh, basically expressed his desire to leave, uh, to start his own entrepreneurial venture, uh, which we respect a lot. Uh, we have identified two internal candidates uh, for this position, and we are in the final stages of uh, deciding between these two candidates. In the next few weeks, uh, we would decide among these two candidates. Uh, but uh, to your question, uh, in all likelihood, it would be an internal candidate and not an external search. Thanks, thanks, Rajesh. Uh, Archit, so on your question on working capital, I mean, compared to last year, as we've said, you know, if, uh, the numbers, if I remember correctly, were about 137, 138 days uh, of sales. And uh, as we've mentioned last time, we've already initiated actions to bring that uh, down to more of a normalized level. Um, of course, last year also had the effect of one-time investment in working capital following the uh, commercialization of the held assets, yeah. So, uh, kind of looking forward, I mean, our, our target is to hold the working capital to between 90 to 100 days, you know, that is our sort of uh, intent and uh, we have started to make headway into that uh, that area and you will obviously see the numbers in the, when we record the first half of the financials in September along with the working capital and cash flow, but you should expect to see it within that range, as I said. Thanks, that's really helpful. All the best. Thanks. Thank you. A reminder to all the participants to limit their questions to two per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, please rejoin the queue. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Anubhav Sahu from Macro Research. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for this. A uh, uh, couple of questions. Uh, one is uh, uh, regarding the supply agreement with Formion. Uh, so if I got it right, uh, we would be supplying uh, uh, molecules for three products, uh, two late stage and one uh, which is already commercial. Uh, if you could talk about, uh, uh, you know, if uh, uh, any, uh, any any indication on the size of the contract or if there is any exclusivity uh, in the contract. And are we here dealing with the non coordination chemistry uh, as far as this contract is concerned? Yeah, so they have actually talked about uh, uh, supply of intermediate for multiple molecules. And as you rightly said, one of them is a commercial molecule and some others are late stage molecules. <clears throat> and there are multiple molecules that uh, have been identified in the agreement. The commercial molecule that we have already started supplying qualification batches for, etc., uh, is a non-fluorinated molecule. So, uh, uh, so that has actually got nothing to do with fluorination. Uh, the other two, uh, out of the other two, there, one of them will be fluorination. Other one will not be a fluorination molecule again. And uh, uh, there is no exclusivity there. They they are free to you know opt in from other suppliers. Currently, they are sourcing from uh, uh, another uh, supplier in Europe. So we will actually be the second supplier because, as I mentioned, these are all late-stage opportunities. So they have already sourced uh, this intermediate till now from another uh, supplier in, in Europe. So there is no question of exclusivity. 
And the material supply agreement that typically gets signed in CDMO because it doesn't have a take or pay or it doesn't require a dedicated investment. Uh, so what typically the way it is framed is they actually give the molecule, they give an indicative volume and, and the indicative pricing gets uh, negotiated and agreed upon. And uh, as per that, uh, we believe that over the three years period, uh, the, the agreement should basically uh, give a revenue of approximately about $40 million. Uh, I think more than the revenue per se, uh, what it really does for us is A, uh, it proves our credibility now to supply molecules outside of our core uh, fluorination value proposition. The second is it actually gives us certain base load and hence a certain revenue and earning visibility because one of the issues that this business has faced is that of a lumpiness. And through these late stage opportunities and through these agreements, that is one of the points that we are trying to address. So that is where this really adds significant value that through contracts like these, we will actually bring in certain steadiness to our business. It's not going to happen from this quarter or next quarter, but we expect that from the next year onward, we will actually start seeing a certain base load which will actually come every quarter. Okay, okay, understood. Quite helpful. And, and so, secondly, on the launch pipeline from the NTP, uh, I believe we have uh, uh, launched three uh, agro intermediates, and fourth one is still to be launched, right? Sure. No, we've actually supplied all four. All four, okay. Okay, Mr. Sophia, yeah, thanks. We supplied all four. We already have three of them already approved. The fourth is currently in the process of getting approval. Okay, okay. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have the next question from the line of Rohit Nagraj from Centrum Broking. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, first question is again on Honeywell. Um, we had indicated last year that uh, during 2023 we will be again, uh, you know, putting up discussions with them uh, for a new HFO facility. Uh, so any uh, uh, further work on this? And apart from this, uh, whether there are any other opportunities on which we are currently discussing with Honeywell? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, what I had mentioned was the first step would be uh, – there would be a kind of a de bottlenecking uh, capex, which will increase the current capacity by about 25%. Uh, so that uh, is an advanced stage of uh, discussion and closure. We expect that within this calendar year, uh, we would close that. And once that happens, we will, you know, it will entail a, a small capex, uh, which we will, it will take us about a year to do that. So we expect that that capex to get uh, done by end of calendar year 24, which means that we will have that additional 25% capa capacity available to us from beginning of calendar year 26. And then post that, we will look at possibly adding another line for the same product. Other than that, there are two other projects that we are currently in discussion with Honeywell, and both of those are uh, progressing extremely well. Right, uh, that's helpful. Uh, and the second question one of, them uh, is, now, one of them is on HFO, another HFO, and the second one is uh, a completely different application. Uh, so that application is uh, not a RefCAS, but uh, I don't know, uh, other than RefCAS application. Uh, there is one HFO. I don't want to talk about the specific application for that HFO because of the confidential reason. But the other one uh, has got nothing to do with refrigerant gas or anything. It's basically in the uh, advanced material. Uh, uh, it's under advanced material uh, business that we are integrating. Right. right. Uh, this is helpful. And second question is that uh, now we have done the uh, maintenance uh, shutdown. Uh, what is the next shutdown uh, that we will undertake uh, on the Honeywell plant, the plant shutdown? If you had asked me this question in the month of May, I would have said that the next shutdown should be next year in around in April. But, you know, immediately a month after that, unfortunately, we experienced a breakdown. Uh, so if you ask me when is the next planned shutdown, it should happen 
uh, in Q1 of FY25. But as you know, this is a new plan, this is a new technology. So as we go, we are also learning uh, more on this technology, etc. So that is not what we expect, but there could be some unforeseen issues. But notwithstanding, the next plan shutdown will happen in Q1 of FY25. Uh, thank you so much for answering all the questions and best of luck, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Tirish Patak from White Oak Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for your opportunity. Uh, to the extent you can share what new uh, capability built up uh, you're doing within the firm, you mentioned uh, 30 crores in Surat, uh, and apart from that, any other uh, you know uh, capability built up that you're doing in the organization. Yeah, so, um, so there are a number of new capabilities that we continue to work on. We actually do the piloting in those and then scale up these uh, capabilities. This is one very important platform, technology platform that we have been working on. Uh, and uh, that is where we are actually investing to set up this particular platform now. Uh, it will be ready by, it will take us approximately about 15 to 18 months to have this uh, uh, planned ready. Uh, it will be ready by end of uh, next year, calendar year 24. And this is a very unique uh, capability. It basically strengthens and expands our existing value proposition. This specific capability or this specific investment was actually done for one particular molecule uh, for uh, which we have a very strong outlook and should give a revenue, uh, should get converted into a revenue of approximately about 45 crore on an annualized basis. But more importantly, this capability actually will position us very, very strongly uh, for future growth. So it will actually help us attract a lot of new uh, projects, uh, not only in agrochemical uh, business, but in other businesses as well. Uh, it positions us extremely strongly to get new projects moving forward. Okay. Anything else uh, apart from this that in the recent past that we've been focusing on? Yes. Yeah, so there are, as I mentioned, there are a lot of other capabilities that uh, we keep developing and bringing on board. Not all new capabilities require completely fresh investment. So some of these capabilities can easily be mapped within the you know current set of assets uh, because of which it doesn't actually get uh, announced. But typically what we do is that we have identified, you know, as I have discussed earlier about our business model around three P's. So one of the P's is that of a platform. So there are chemistry and technology platforms that we continue to develop. And typically what we do is this get developed in R&D, then they are taken to a pilot, and then we either map them in our existing assets or we have to invest in completely new set of assets. So this one was the first one which required a completely new set of assets. But, you know, we've, we've actually developed multiple such platforms which got mapped in uh, in our existing assets. But this is an ongoing exercise, and this is what we believe will continue to differentiate us from uh, other players uh, in India and, and globally. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, May we request you to please limit your questions to one per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, please rejoin the queue. Thank you. We'll take the next question from the line of Dhwanit Savla from DN Trading. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, I just had a question with regard to uh, the interest cost in our uh, uh, balance sheet. Uh, I just wanted to know that uh, what is the average cost of uh, you know the debt we are we, we are paying right now, and is there uh, is there any provision to prepay or our, our debt, or is is it primarily going to be used to fund for the capex? And uh, just uh, one more point that uh, there has been a significant increase in depreciation. Uh, is, is there any particular reason, or is it just because of our new facilities which we have? Uh, brought in uh, this quarter. All right, Tony, this is here. Let me take those questions. <clears throat> so your question on depreciation is exactly right. It's all related to new capacities coming on stream. And 
and uh, those are also reflected in the standalone numbers and the console numbers. So the difference you can see relates largely to the head assets. Yeah. On the interest cost, um, see our, our sort of philosophy on funding these assets, and, and uh, of course all of the interest cost relates to the new assets that have been commissioned in, uh, in the age. And uh, the philosophy around funding these is we we ensure that you know they are taken on a term loan which gives us sufficient uh, uh, space to allow for the assets to fund for those in interest costs by themselves. So if you see our intent is that you know any new asset that we fund, any new asset that we fund, we essentially ensure that the uh, asset is self-paying on the interest and the principal components thereof. So we take some moratorium for the principal side, but the interests are funded regularly. The average cost of borrowing for us is in the range of about 8.3%. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll come back in the queue and find any further questions. Sure. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jason Soans from ITBI Capital. Please go ahead. So thanks for taking my question. So I had a limited question, you know, uh, as per se, uh, we're seeing a lot of weakness in the global agrochemical chain. And what we come to understand is there's a lot of dumping from uh, from China as well, where they're driving down prices of intermediates, uh, a category where we compete as well, uh, probably not in the same value chain, but we do compete in there. And uh, so basically intermediate prices are getting driven down as well as finished goods. So I understand we have contracted volumes and our margin would be stable probably since we have contracted volumes. But I just wanted to understand from you, is there a risk to the absolute EBITDA or EBITDA per ton, however you calculate it for our intermediates, uh, you know, in terms of contract revisions or something in light of this falling prices and this uh, inventory restocking? No, so, uh, you know, if you actually uh, read my commentary over the last let's say two years, one of the things that I have constantly been saying whenever there was a question related to China plus one, mm -hmm. I have always mentioned that China will be back and China mm -hmm. will be back with vengeance. Hence, it is extremely important to select the value chains that you want to play in very, very carefully because there are certain value chains where the SOEs are extremely strong and those are the value chains which are going to get impacted severely. Some of that we have already started seeing this particular year. We have been very careful in selecting opportunities uh, in value chains where we don't see a direct competition from China and, and uh, hence no uh, straight uh, uh, threat coming in from China. So in some of our, in, in all of, most of our new molecules, so molecules which uh, are mapped in, let's say, the H or some of the new opportunities that we have been working on in agro or otherwise, we are not really seeing any immediate uh, threat from China, at least not at this point in time. Having said that, there are some old molecules in our portfolio there where we actually don't even have any long-term agreements or, or things like that. That is where we are actually seeing some pressure, but that's, you know, as a percentage of our total portfolio, that, that's a very small percentage, and it doesn't have, hence it doesn't have any material impact on our overall margins. Okay, so thank you so much for answering that. And so my next question is, just wanted to touch upon in terms of spectrum, you have highlighted before that the contribution is broadly 40 pharma, 40 40% pharma, 40% agrochem, and 20% are the emerging areas or industrial. So what is the current proportion and how do you see this mix changing? You know, and probably you can just uh, give me some color on uh, how the outlook for pharma or other emerging areas is in terms of specialty chemicals. Yeah, so uh, I think just one point before I answer yes. that question. To your earlier question, yes. uh, my commentary was specifically related to specialty, yeah? Because the question that you are asking whether we have been impacted by some of that dumping, etc., actually holds true for HPP, where, you know, where I've already provided the commentary around R22. So my commentary was specific to your question, which was around speciality. So I just want to make that clear, that this is not related to R22 or, you know, other uh, products that we have in other business units. 
as far as the uh, breakup is concerned you are absolutely right earlier it was 40 40 20 40 from pharma 40 from agro and 20 from industrial and uh, as i have mentioned uh, you know from last year onwards we have actually uh, started reducing our uh, pharma business because we believe that that's not really a long term sustainable and profitable business for us Hence, we have consciously been uh, reducing that particular business, getting out of low-margin products and not really uh, actively working on any new opportunities on the pharma side within the specialty. Uh, as you might know, specialty business focuses on generic uh, pharma business, primarily working with the Indian pharmaceutical companies as against CDMO business where we work with innovators and on patented molecules. So that's a very fundamental difference between the pharma business that we target under these two business units. So currently, a significant portion actually comes from agrochemicals and industrial, and there is a very small percentage which comes from performance material. As we move forward, we believe that the performance material, uh, a percentage of sales coming from performance material will go up agrochemical will continue to remain same as an overall percentage of, of the of business. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Sons, may we request you to kindly rejoin the queue. We have other, several other participants who are waiting for their turn. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, may we request you to kindly limit your questions to one per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, please rejoin the queue. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ranveer Singh from Novama. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, uh, my question relates to that Honeywell contract. That 410 million contract initially we talked about, of that, uh, what portion we have already supplied and what remains now? No, as I, I think, as I had indicated, it's a seven-year contract. Uh, so we've actually <clears throat> just in the first year of supply of that particular contract. So we've just started, you know, we're at the, uh, really at the starting point right now, the contract. So some person was captured in FY23 and uh, in, in Q1, uh, FY24, right? That's correct. Okay. And so this is, this may not be evenly spread across the years. So if you could just give some, uh, you know, uh, indicate that whether this is concentrated it was initial years or the larger part will come in later years of this contract? No, so once the plant ramp up happens, it was supposed to be almost even across the year. It has not been because of some of these challenges that we have faced in Q1, as I mentioned to you, which were primarily from the supply side. Uh, but otherwise, the uh, the supply under the contract was supposed to be even post uh, ramp up of the plant. Okay, and you talked about 25% uh, uh, capacity expansion through deep bottlenecking. So this is towards that uh, the same 410 million contract or the contract size is also expected to increase from it. No, no. Uh, that will be over and above that contract because okay. that was for the 100% capacity and now we will actually uh, increase that by uh, another 25%. So that will be over and above the original agreement and which is what we are currently uh, in negotiation with them to uh, revise that initial contract to add on uh, the volume, uh, this particular 25% volume to that initial contract. Okay, okay. Fine, fine, fine. And so in FY23, can you attribute any percentage? What percentage we have supplied so far? No. I think that okay. will be very difficult for us. Okay. Nice. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this would be the last question for today, which is from the line of Nitin Agarwal from the AM Capital. Please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. Now, this, on the uh, specialty business, uh, you know, when you look through the next say, 12, 18 odd months, uh, what the drivers of the business will be what? It will be the scale up of the MPP contract uh, and uh, the newer uh, and the new uh, specialty chemical project, which is uh, which is likely to come up uh, in FY25. Uh, beyond these, what other drivers would be there for this business? 
so uh, i think uh, there is the i think there will be four or five drivers one uh, you know there are plants in surat right now which are not running to full capacity as i had indicated earlier so surat will actually ramp up to its you know almost to full capacity so that's point number one point number two the mpp that we have invested in in uh, the hage that we will actually ramp up the capacity utilization in that number three the dedicated agro project that we have invested in where the plant uh, is supposed to be commissioned by end of this year so that will add a significant uh, uh, number to uh, our revenue this one and fourth there are other uh, projects that we are working on which don't require large new capexes which require minor debottlenecking here and there some of that will happen in sura some of that will happen in the hage so these are the four uh, uh, growth drivers which will more or less happen given the current capex announcement that have happened over and above that there are number of new molecules and opportunities that we are currently working on which are in the pipeline but those will have to be then uh, converted into specific capexes then we will have to go to the board and get approval on but these are the four sets of growth opportunities uh, with the current set of capexes and uh, just to uh, on on the four points that you mentioned is it fair to assume that the new multi year contract scaler probably would be the largest contributor of of these four or as you know, in terms of significance yeah i would uh, imagine so and secondly on the cdmo business uh, you know you mentioned that the 16 million dollar contract we pretty much serviced out last year uh, and this year and, and this fresh sort of supplies come in only uh, the next fresh pio comes in only in fy25 so from a fy24 perspective will cdmo be like a, a possible decline year versus last year no it will uh, we hope that it will not be a declining year uh, we we are still trying to track the similar kind of a growth trajectory as i had mentioned to you the uh the the sales split will probably change last year there was a significant percentage of our total sales which came from excuse me late stage repeat business whereas here there will be lot of uh, a significant percentage of the total sales will come from new business so the split will be different but we expect that there will be uh uh there will be a nominal increase uh, in that is what is expected there will be a nominal increase in this particular year but we will see a significant uptick in the following year and lastly on cdmo uh, in the uh, you know the, the the shift in strategy you talked about does it also imply uh, differentiated margins versus you know do you make more margins in products where you work through the commercial through the initial development phases what is product that you take on in the late commercial late development phases so so the margins you know the contrary at the contribution margin levels you know they they differ but i think what you'll have to look at is that if they are at an initial stage though the contribution margin is high typically the fixed cost required to service that business is also significantly high so if you look at the operating margin level they are almost even out Okay, and obviously the late stage molecules come with a much higher volumes. Uh, That's correct. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. As that was the last question for today, I would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Thank you. So I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out and joining on the call today. I hope we have been able to respond to your queries adequately. If you have any further queries you may reach out to our investor relations partner Orient Capital. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you very much sir. Ladies and gentlemen on behalf of Navin Florin International Limited that concludes this conference. We thank you for joining us and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you. Thank you.